Have you or someone you know had working mother burnout? Dr. Susan Landers is a neonatologist who had first-hand experience while pregnant with her first child. She is going to show us how to identify it and recover from it. You do not want to miss this interview today. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. With me today is Dr. Susan Landers. She is a neonatologist who worked full-time in the NICU for over 30 years, and she has also raised three children. She achieved many academic and professional accomplishments, and she encountered challenges, of course, along the way, both in her career and in her mothering. Welcome, Dr. Susan. Oh, thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, this is exciting because, well, for many reasons, but there are a lot of young moms and mm -hmm. moms who, like myself, have lived through this and did not have a resource of help, which I know you're going to share today when you share your your book as well. So I thank you for that. So let's start with sharing a bit of your story, the trauma that you went through when you were pregnant with your first child, and whatever else you would like to share about your backstory. I finished medical school in South Carolina where I grew up, and then I moved to Texas and did my pediatric residency training in Dallas and neonatology fellowship training in Houston. So I had finished six years of specialty training and became a neonatologist in my early 30s. At that time, I got married. I had put off getting married for a while. Okay. And we decided to have a family. And I thought, okay, I'm a good doctor. <laughs> I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to be a good mother. I had a complicated pregnancy. A lot of problems with nausea and vomiting in the first trimester. I would go to work and throw up in the uh. trash can and keep <laughs> making rounds with the residents. It was horrible. But in the middle trimester, I developed premature labor, uh, ruptured membranes, and I went into the hospital terrified because I knew what it was like oh, to care for right. a premature baby, right. to have a premature baby to take care of that kind of baby in the NICU and the neonatal ICU with all the lines and tubes and respirators and medicines. And I was terrified. I suddenly was no longer a doctor. I was just a mama and I was a scared mom. Aww. At 20, at 25 weeks gestation, they were able to stop my labor and my membrane sealed back over. So I was on antibiotics and steroids and some uh, Valium for anxiety. <laughs> and three weeks later, so I stayed in the hospital three weeks, my obstetrician allowed me to go home and I stayed in bed at home for an additional six weeks. During that time, I felt like a total failure. Aww. As a mother, as a pregnant person, as a, as a future mother, as a doctor, I mean, I couldn't even be pregnant correctly. And I had spent so much time training to be a neonatologist and um, 
read a lot of books about being a mom. Back then, we didn't have the internet, so you had to read books to get information. And I was ready to do the best job I could. And here, this complicated pregnancy just tackled me Mm -hmm. right in my tracks. Mm -hmm. And I had to come to terms with feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, feeling fear. My partners would come and visit me, and some of them would say, why are you crying? And I'd get upset and start crying. And I I said, you know, I'm I'm scared. I'm I'm a mom. I'm scared. I don't want to have a premature baby. And so my son was born at 36 weeks gestation. He was perfectly fine, four weeks early, did not have any lung disease, only stayed in the hospital a week. And he was a great, easy baby to take care of. I could breastfeed. I knew how to take care of him. And so the story ends well with a normal baby. But (laughs) that period of time taught me so much about the mothers of premature babies, the mothers who deliver sick babies, the, the mothers who have the children that I was taking care of. I was trained to take care of premature babies who were desperately ill right. and term right. newborn babies who were sick. And so my, th- my experience gave me compassion for what they go through with fear, with guilt, with hopelessness, with helplessness. And it made me a better doctor. In retrospect, I was mm. able to connect with the mothers of my patients in a way that I don't think I would have been if I had not gone through that experience. I always wanted to tell them, your baby's going to be fine if I knew that was the case. Your baby will grow and thrive and you're going to take home a healthy baby. I would say that if I knew that was going to be the case. I was also very honest when something went wrong. I treated the patient's parents like I wanted to be treated. And that experience of a complicated pregnancy the first time taught me how to respect what patients and parents are feeling and what they what kind of information and help they want. You cannot believe how much I am personally relating to what you are saying. I had my first oh. child. I had my first child when I was forty. Was told that I would never be pregnant, and then mm. ended up spending most of that time in the hospital. Was was told that almost every day that this baby may or may not survive. That yeah. if at at best she may be two pounds, and you know it just went on. It was a complete nightmare. Mm-hmm. So as you are speaking, I am relating a hundred percent. If I'm relating, the audience, many in the audience yes. are relating. And yes, I did have a healthy baby born six weeks early at six pounds six <laughs> ounces. So <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, good, I can good, relate good. to that yeah. part too. But anyway, my first question to you is what is a neonatologist? A neonatologist is a pediatrician who has subspecialty training to take care of sick infants in the intensive care unit. We attend uh, high-risk deliveries of twins, triplets. Boy, I've seen quads and quints and (laughs) everything (laughs) in my career. We talk to parents. Before delivery, we talk to parents every day at the bedside. We consult with obstetricians. Sometimes we meet with families before delivery to talk about an impending birth of a baby with a birth defect and what that problem will create and the kind of treatment the baby will need. So it's a super specialized pediatrician who takes care of children who are hospitalized in the intensive care unit until they're strong enough to go home. Do most hospitals have one on staff? Large hospitals will have neonatologists on staff in their NICU. Children's hospitals will generally have large uh, NICUs with lots of neonatologists on staff. A smaller city hospital or a rural hospital may not have a NICU but they'll have a referral system set up so that if a baby is born who needs 
extra care, the baby can be transferred to another center with a higher level of care. I wanted to be a surgeon when I finished medical school, and I was dating a guy who also was going into general surgery, and he said he didn't think it was the right thing to marry a surgeon, a woman who's a surgeon. And as shocking as that sounds right now, back then in the 70s, in the deep south, I thought, well... (laughs) I should change and do something that's more typical for women, and that's when I chose pediatrics, in the back of my mind, thinking that I would do pediatric surgery. Well, I broke up with, yeah, I broke up with this guy, uh, and it's a good thing, and uh, during my pediatrics rotations, I fell in love with neonatology. It's a lot like pediatric surgery in that there are lots of procedures, we do lots of intervention, We're dealing with ventilators and lines and tubes and chest tubes and various things. So it's very intensive. So at what point in your career did you decide to make this change? When I left medical school, I uh, entered a pediatric residency thinking that I would ultimately be, be a pediatric surgeon. But in my training, I fell in love with neonatology. It's a lot like surgery. There are lots of procedures, lots of lines and tubes and uh, various okay. therapies. It's very intensive. So it uh, fed my need for excitement in my practice of medicine. It, being in the ICU is very rewarding because people generally get well quickly mm. and respond to therapy. So I decided not to go into surgery and got three additional years of training in neonatology. And I loved it. I loved taking care of sick infants and getting to know their families. It it was a very, very rewarding career. I felt actually a part of some of the families being at the delivery of premature triplets and then taking care of three little girls for six months until they were well enough to go home was really a fun thing to do and not only was it practicing medicine but it was attending to Mm -hmm, the needs mm -hmm, of the moms mm -hmm. and the parents yeah it was fun well this is so interesting i really appreciate everything that you are sharing i was not aware of that so thank you (laughs) um we are going to take a quick 30 second break and when we come back i want you to talk about how women share their concerns with you regarding not being good enough Mm. we'll be right back Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never, ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. So how often do women share their concerns with you that they're not good enough moms? And do they do this because of the problems that they seem to be encountering regarding that? Or is it something more towards working mother burnout? I think young women today uh, talk with me about why it's so hard to be a good working mother. And I can appreciate where they are except now society has heaped upon them in addition to having a full-time job or career, taking care of a family, perhaps being married or in a partnership, society expects them to be perfect, to look at images Uh, on uh, uh social media, to read uh, on the internet how to do things this way, how to do things correctly, how to get it all perfect and look good. And I, I fear that these curated images of 
perfect mothers with well-dressed children and well-behaved <laughs> children are influencing young women to think they should do more than they're doing. Oh, okay. And what and what I talk about with young working mothers is that what they are doing is difficult. My own daughter, who's a pediatric ICU nurse, she has two children, six and two. She's working full time and working on a master's to become a nurse practitioner. Uh One Sunday afternoon, the kids were acting up and she was probably tired or stressed. And she said, Mom, why is this so hard? And I said, Honey, it's hard. What you're doing is a lot. Uh And you're you're working full time, you're taking care of your kids, you're maintaining your marriage, you don't have that much extra time to take care of yourself. And she said, I just want to be good enough. And I said, I know you do. Everyone does, honey. But the thing is, don't expect yourself to be perfect. None of us who work for a living are perfect. Uh We're not there some of the time. You cannot be with your kids 24-7 if you hold down a job, unless you work at home and then you're really lucky to have remote work that allows you full access to your children. But if you're away from your children, someone else is taking care of them, not you. Right. You may miss certain things. You may miss milestones. You may feel torn between a job you like doing and being a mom. I've been there. I felt that. I love taking care of patients in the NICU. And when my kids were at home sick with somebody else, I felt really bad about that. If they were happy in school, I was not quite as uh, guilty feeling. So I think what younger working moms are feeling is the stress of having to do it all without getting permission to juggle some things. What I mean by that is if you're working full tilt and you have two small kids, you've got to fit in a little bit of time for exercise and a little bit of time with your friends and a little bit of time, quiet space alone for yourself. And maybe you have to give up something else. Maybe you have to ask your husband to cook dinner half the time. Maybe you have to hire a housekeeper to come in the house because you're just exhausted and don't want to do all the chores. Maybe you have to ask your mother for some help babysitting so you can go out and have a date night with your husband. So I think it's the juggling act that's so difficult with the onset of and the rise of social media. We connect on our phones and on our computers. And the way I grew up as a young mother was connecting with my friends in person. Mm -hmm. We would, we would talk to each other at work. We would visit together for play dates on the weekend. We would support each other with uh, questions and solutions. We would get together as families and I'm not seeing young families do this as much today as we used to. So I think that sets us up to think we're supposed to be doing more when in fact Mm -hmm. we've filled our days already with all of our jobs. That chronic stress, Carol, as you know, that leads to burnout. Of course. So what solution is there? Burnout is essentially the result of unresolved chronic stress. And so the solution is quite honestly, taking a step back, taking a break, making some space to assess where you are, what you're doing, what your priorities are, what are the most important things in your life. If it's your job and your two or three kids and your husband, so be it. But you have to put yourself on that list as well. You have to say, I can't take care of anybody else if I don't take care of me and figure out how to get outside and walk around the block three or four days a week, (laughs) how to go to a yoga class with a friend one day a week, how to journal your feelings at night in uh, in a journal before you go to sleep, 
how to really talk to your spouse or partner about the stresses that you're under, how to share the load. Men do not carry the same mental load as women do. And I think young mothers need to be given the permission to ask for some help in sharing that load. But it starts with self-assessment. It starts with, where am I? How did I get here? Why is it so stressful? What are the things that are triggering my stress? If it's a bad job, you're going to have to change jobs Uh or work with a different manager or talk to your boss about flexible scheduling. And those are very uncomfortable conversations to have. Oh, I remember I talked to my boss when I was in my 40s and had three kids. I said, my nanny's complaining about working more than 50 hours a week. (laughs) And he said, well, you need to get a weekend nanny. And I just looked at him. Oh, my goodness. I know. I said, what? Are you kidding? He said, look, you got to you got to work 60 plus hours a week around here. And I went, "Okay." I mean, at least he told me the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was silly enough to try to do it. But um, there may be conversations that we have to have with bosses or managers about flexible scheduling, better pay, having time off in the middle of the day to go do something at the school that you need to with the children. And all of that is juggling. All of that is mental load and extra work for moms to figure out how to keep all these irons in the fire, so to speak. And is this basically what you address in your book, which is? My book is called So Many Babies, and it is a recollection of my favorite NICU patient stories and their parents. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And they all gave me permission to tell their baby stories. And it recalls my motherhood struggles, trying to be a working mother, trying to do it all trying to not get burned out, which happened to me at age 42, trying to do everything perfectly and be everything to everybody and left myself off my own list. And with chronic stress of a high stress job and three busy kids, I got totally burned Uh out. uh I, I had to change jobs and become a medical director of a small HMO for a couple of years to kind of downshift and figure out what happened, what I wanted, what I needed to do, how to take care of myself. My husband helped. And we had some pretty um, tough soul searching conversations because his job was great. And I resented the fact (laughs) that he had such a great job and mine was difficult. And we wrote down chores, we wrote down lists of responsibilities And my list was way longer than his. And I gave him some things to do on his list. Hmm. And so things like that helped. I also ended up changing jobs. I left academic medicine and went into private practice where I would have more control over my schedule, more flexibility with scheduling, more downtime to be with the kids, to do things that were good for me possibly share one of your favorite stories from your book? My daughter, Anne, at age 16, came back from camp. She had been a counselor, a junior counselor at a summer camp. And she probably weighed 110 pounds. And, you know, she was just beautiful because she was a swimmer. She was very fit. And she walked, walked back in at the beginning of her junior year of high school and said, I need to go on a diet. And I went, what? honey, you're thin. You do not need to go on a diet. Well, she went on a diet. And over the next three months or so, she pretended to eat. She didn't really eat. She pushed her food around on a plate and ran upstairs and said, I need to study. You know, she had three AP classes. She was captain of the swim team. She uh, took an SAT prep course And she was just one of these little driven perfectionists. I guess she was trying to be like her mom, I'm sorry to say. (laughs) And so a month or two went by and I called her best friend's mom and said, Sally, what in the world is wrong with Anne? She's not eating. And Sally said, 
well, she's not eating at school, according to my daughter, and she's not eating at our house. So she, if she's not eating at your house, that means she's got an eating disorder. I went, oh, my God. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Right. I cut my hours back to half time to, in order to get her the help she needed to get the nutritionist, to get the therapist, to go with her to appointments, to spend more time with her, to learn how to help her along as she experienced refeeding. I was scared enough to know that something had to give with my schedule and how I was balancing my life I needed to cut back my hours to be there for her to get her to the therapy that she needed and I needed her to see me making her more important than my work during this period of time Mm -hmm. and so and so this is one example of how our children will throw at us occasionally big problems and usually they, they just toss little things to us but every now and then they're going to throw something really big and we do have to adjust our working mom lives pivot try to figure Mm. out how to how to get them taken care of have heart to hearts with our bosses our managers and say my kid's more important to me than this job right right. now and I've got to pull back And I've got to make some adjustments. And I'm glad that I was willing to do that. So I did it when when I was in my early 40s in a bad job and I needed to change jobs. And then I did it again in my 50s when Ann was sick as a teenager. And I have no regrets. Pulling back from a busy job to either take care of myself or to address a problem in a child is something that all working mothers face. I I have no doubt about that. We all face it in one way or another. And it is a necessary part of being a working mom, learning how to define your priorities. And who should buy your book? Oh, thanks. Anybody who wants to be reassured about how hard it is to be a working mom, about how difficult it is to think your kids are okay and deal with things like bullying in school and a child with dyslexia and other stories like that. I want uh, moms of preemies to know that most Mm. of the preemies we take care of get better, grow and thrive. And and regular moms of full-term babies to know that what they're doing is really difficult. And if a pediatrician can struggle this much to make it all work, then what they're doing makes sense it is difficult it is hard to be a mom and to be 24 7 either with your kids or at work and it takes a lot of skill and when you do that you are good enough none of us can do it perfectly but all of us are good enough to know when we're working okay and when we're with our children okay That's the secret to being a good enough mother. You're there when they need you, and somebody else is looking after them when they don't need you. And so that's the definition of good enough mother. Letting them learn some independence when you're not around and doing what you love to do, but also caring about their well-being and being there when you can. That was perfect. Excellent. And a great summary. Is there anything else you want to say in summary or any word of encouragement other than what you have already shared? I think I want to emphasize that talking to your friends who are going through the same thing is honey on toast. It is just (laughs) the, the way we soothe and support each other. And personal connection, especially with a good friend, especially one who's going through what you're going through, is the most important thing. Maybe even more than explaining everything to your spouse, because women understand each other. We all carry this mental load I mentioned. We all try to be perfect. And when your best friend looks at you and says, you're doing a pretty good job, you're likely to believe her. Excellent. I love that. Thank you. Mm. And thank you so much, 
Dr. Susan Landers for being on Never, Ever Give Up Hope. Hmm. Thank you, Carol. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for listening to Never, Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.